Well, this 2012 thing has a lot of people concerned. But I'll tell you what, our next guest, Mr. David Sarita, is an extraordinary individual. And without any further ado, please come into the global living room, won't you, sir? And let's talk about all these wonderful things that uh, you're involved in from the early sunrise in Greenland to the evolving consciousness of mankind and maybe even a little hope for humanity. Welcome. Thank you, John. Good to finally meet you and, and to be on the show with you tonight. Well, I'm glad that you could make it. I um, Say, what uh, what's... What's up with this 2012 thing, and why is so much stuff happening here, and why are all these airports changing their runway markings? Because the um, the direction of magnetic north is changing so much. Well, you know, it's the mainstream media kind of eludes the real truth about what's going on. I mean, we can see directly from NASA that the natural drift rate of magnetic north pole in the 20th century was 10 kilometers per year drifting towards Siberia. But in the 21st century, their data suggests we're at 40 kilometers per year drift rate. So we have a sudden radical increase of four times drift rate over the previous um, century. So something's happening. And then when they announced on NPR News and CNN that they had to change the runways, they made it look like, okay, we waited too long to do this. And when they do, there is a natural drift rate, but the natural drift rate actually drifts to and from the, 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 the there's, you have the, the physical North Pole and then you have the magnetic North Pole. And so what happens in a laboratory, if you take a magnet, a strong magnet in your hand, this will be really easy for people to understand. The physical Earth is a physical magnet. It have, we have a molten and a solid iron core and nickel core in the center of the Earth. In fact, it was previously thought because the magnetic field around the Earth is so weak that the, the Earth's core had a weak magnetic field. But just recently, and this is very, very new, for the first time we've measured the Earth's magnetic field at the core. And it's actually at 25 Gauss, which is actually incredibly strong. I mean, if we were living in a, in a field of even two or three Gauss, it would actually melt our brains. We're, we're used to living, you know, in an environment in the milligauss range. I mean, we're lucky if we even have one milligauss of background radiation living in a city with all of the cell phones and all of the, you know, TV transmission lines. So the Earth's magnet is quite strong. And if you hold a magnet in front of a radio transmitter, it vibrates. So what happens in the, in the solar system is that the sun sends electromagnetic pulses to the Earth, and like a radio transmitter. And because the Earth is a magnet, it wobbles. It actually vibrates. And in that vibrational pattern, we get changes in the, the, the alignment of the north magnetic magnetic field and the physical magnetic field is the physical magnet and it vibrates in correspondence to that magnetic field vibration. So what's happening now is an acceleration. There's no doubt that in NASA's data that we see a huge increase in the drift rate. But what is utterly astounding in the way the media kind of buries the story of the Greenland early sunrise is the Greenland normally goes into, just like in Alaska, you get the, the land of the midnight sun. So you get, the sun never really sets in the summer for a, for a period of time, depending on how far north you live. And the same thing happens in the dead of winter. So, you know, this, this town in Greenland, it reported that the sun rises every year on the 13th of January for the first time coming out of that darkness. Right. And it rose on January the 11th at 1 p.m. So you have 1, 11, 11, 2011. So you have, you know, the first, you know, hour. Uh, so it's, it's all 11. It's kind of like a mystical number. You wonder like that. Is, is that a coincidence that this happened? And so everybody, well, it must have been the ice melting. And that this is really laughable science. In fact, in Time magazine, 
you know, most astrophysicists disagreed with the ice melting because that's the first thing they said, oh, we can't believe that the sun would rise two days early. Because if you take the 24,000 mile circumference of the Earth and you see, I mean, this is on a flat two-dimensional plane, that there's 365 days in a year, so, you know, roughly 360 degrees, you know, turning around the sun. The planet Earth makes one revolution around the sun per year on its tilted axis. So one degree, what is one degree on the horizon out of those 360 degrees? Well, with our 24,000 mile circumference, one degree is about 67 miles, you know, roughly. It's very close to that. So for the sun to rise two days early, you, of course, it's not a full degree to rise two days early. In fact, it's nowhere near that. But a mile is 5,280 feet. That's just one mile. So you imagine how much ice would have to melt in a single year for that theory to be correct. And you would have to melt miles of ice for that theory to be correct. I mean, many miles. I don't know the exact number, but it's a full degree is 67 miles. So that's 67 miles of ice to have a full degree change in the Earth. That's the physical Earth. That's not the Earth's magnetic field. So with all the the hoopla and the berry of you know the, the, the cover up of the story, it was just always oh, just the melting ice. But in Time magazine, they disagreed. Well, <clears throat> I found research online in the actual town um, of. In, in Greenland, where this is actually occurring, a local resident took out his compass. His name is Johnny Tarhanen, and it's hosted at poleshifting.com. And he measured his compass on the 11th of January and noticed it was three to four degrees off of true north. Three to four degrees. I mean, that's... That's a lot. That's 67 miles times four. Yeah. That's huge. And then... By the 14th of January, it went back to normal. Now, that is incredible. Because let's go, let's get a bigger picture of what's happening. Because first of all, we see a compass is measuring the magnetic field, not necessarily the physical Earth. But to get an early sunrise, and, and this, is a, this is a huge subject, because, well, some scientists are saying the ice is melting, other scientists are saying because the ice is melting, the mountains in Greenland are pushing up because they don't have all that weight on them anymore. So there's no way they can win the argument that that's what happened. And then you understand that the physical Earth would have had to wobble by at least a degree or, or possibly less to have a two-day sunrise. Um, but that's a lot, you know, even if it's mild. Now, what happened? Let's go earlier you know, back in the picture here. Because we see from geo, geological sensor data, we have these earthquake sensors placed all over the planet. They're distributed in various places. And when an earthquake goes off, the sensors that are further away from the quake get a weaker signal. But on December 22nd of 2010, suddenly all the sensors all over the Earth all went off with a full signal strength at the same time. This wasn't an earth, this was like a vibration. Our solar system is traveling at about a mil 11 million miles per day around the Milky Way galaxy. So we're entering new fields of space every single day, all the time, that we, there's no way we can predict what will happen when the solar system travels through those magnetic fields. And it's really incredible because what happens is with this theory of 2012 is that we're going to go into this new energy and there's going to be either a big shift of energy that's going to affect every living thing on the planet, including the planet itself, and possibly trigger earth changes and earthquakes, which could help explain all of the drastic things that are happening right now. So when you go into a new energy field, changes are very sudden. You get these sudden vibrations, and so there it was. Everybody missed it, and I got this email on the USGS site, and certainly it is very different than the normal background of earthquake data. You get these strong spikes in one location and weak uh, spikes or no spikes in another location, but this was every sensor in the world at the same time. This That's amazing. The 23rd, the next day, the largest storm ever recorded on Saturn erupts. 
In fact, the storm is still going on today, and it's far bigger than our planet, which is proof that the whole solar system was entering a new field of energy that was vibrating everything. And then suddenly, within days, you know, you talk about the 1st of January, you have the birds dying and things falling out of the sky. Oh, yes. And then I'm just going through a chain of events here, right? And then what? all of a sudden, on the... 13, on the 11th of January, which is a 11111, you get this possible wobble in the physical field of the Earth. Now, prior to that, I had gotten emails from private physics conferences where they stated that some of the recent solar flares that we've had, which are quite powerful, they've seen magnetic north wobble 500 miles just momentarily and then come back. Only 500? and then come back. And then come back. So, you know, that's private data. But 500 miles is not quite uh, not quite 10 degrees, right? Right. Because 67 miles per degree times 10 is 670 miles. But that's a long way, 600, a 500-mile wobble. What happens with a physical magnet in a magnetic field is if the magnetic field strength changes or shifts, for long enough, eventually the physical magnet will be affected by that movement. And that's when you get a pole shift. David, tell us what vibrations and magnetism and electromagnetic energy means to the human being. I, I have often wondered if it was a very good idea for all these. Of course, I'm delighted to be broadcasting with you over uh, countless numbers of them, but I've wondered what effect uh, even big television and radio transmitters have on the human condition. I couldn't help but notice uh, one of the popular jogging paths has some high-tension power lines running over them, and all the treetops are all distorted and so forth. So I suppose electromagnetism, uh, solar bursts of electromagnetic radiation can be your friend, can be detrimental, yes? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, let's, let's first start with measuring, you know, I've spent you know, the last several years developing technologies in the lab to firstly measure, I personally measured almost a 1,000 people's millivolts in their electrical bodies. We are electrical systems. We have nerves that are like wires. We're, we're like a semi, um, liquid crystal semiconductor. We have water, minerals, and we have nervous systems that run positive and negative ions. And no two persons has the same body voltage, and that is because of, you know, either not getting enough proper minerals in their diet or not getting enough contact with the earth energy. And so some of the things that I've done is I've developed technologies, you know, quantum energy generators where I've been able to vibrate crystalline stone pendants and jewelry and put them in contact with people and measure the changes in their electrical field. We are so weak in electrical energy that on the surface, you know, the average person might have 100 millivolts in their nervous system, which is a really, really weak field. Using these things called squids, which are these, these quantum sensors that can measure the electromagnetic field radiating from the human being's heart, a dog or a cat or even a leaf. I mean, these sensors are so super powerful that they can actually prove and, and sense the fields of energy that radiate off her body. And then, you know, later we developed, um, Konstantin Korotkov in Russia um, developed the most advanced human aura cameras. You know, they can actually see the human energy field. And when you understand how electromagnetism coming from the sun affects living things, and how weak that field from the sun is by the time it gets to our planet and our biological system. We're so sensitive that the tiniest changes in electromagnetic fields can alter our DNA. Our actual DNA can change. Now, it was previously thought by medical doctors and biologists that energy was the ruler of the universe, that energy was telling the biology or the matter of the planet what to do. So we imagine our planet moving at 11 million miles a day around the galaxy and we're rising north above the galactic plane at over 300,000 miles a day. We're going faster than any spaceship has ever traveled. And so what happens is these super sensitive organisms that we are, and many of us are too weak, 
when we suddenly receive a huge impetus of energy, of cosmic energy, it affects our consciousness.